Some time has passed since the events of the first movie. Christopher Robin, who survived the massacre in Hundred Acre Forest, has been acquitted by the police, but not everyone believes his stories about giant killer animals that have never been found, and many are still think that the real killer is him. Christopher sees a psychologist, and these sessions not only help him come to terms with reality, but also allow him to look back into his childhood to remember something he has long forgotten, the face of the man who 20 years ago kidnapped his brother Billy and six other children. Meanwhile, Pooh, Owl, Piglet and Tigger decide that they can no longer hide in the forest, and if they want to survive, they must attack those who wants them dead. Hardly anyone will argue with the fact that the first part of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey attracted such attention not because of its outstanding artistic merits, but only because of the fact that its authors timely oriented themselves, picking up the public domain rights to the Alan Milne's book about Winnie the Pooh, and then competently rode the wave of hype, raised by the news that all the familiar characters will become heroes of slasher. The movie turned out to be not exactly talentless, but, let's say, as mediocre as possible, but $5 million earned on a budget of $100,000 eloquently hinted at the fact that they found a gold mine. The biggest surprise of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2 is that its authors not only did not cheat when they promised that the sequel would surpass the original, but did such a massive work on the mistakes that decided to write off the first movie. In the sequel, where Christopher Robin is played by a different actor, the previous film is presented as a movie within a movie, as a stab in the Scream franchise, and at one point it is even shown on TV. The screenwriter, director and producer of Winnie the Pooh Reese Frake Waterfield said that the second part would have a budget five times higher than that of the original, but in the process of filming it was raised ten times, up to a million dollars, and most of this money was spent on visuals, plastic makeup and murder scenes, which here are not just a lot, but an insane amount, and they look much more brutal and realistic, because the authors attracted real masters in this field. If the first part in this respect dangled somewhere on the level of average thrash from Troma Studio, then Blood and Honey 2 is made according to the precepts of Lucio Fulci, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Terrifier 2, for connoisseurs of exaggeratedly sadistic and yet quite convincing dismemberment it is a real treat. Unfortunately, in terms of scripting and directing the situation hasn't changed that radically, it's still a confusing mess, built on stupid plot moves and poorly argued from the point of view of everyday logic. What can you say, if the police, investigating a potential killer's lair, enter it with flashlights, but without even unholstering their weapons? And if in the technical part of the picture the complaints are minimal, there are a lot of questions to Reese Frake Waterfield as a director and screenwriter. And it is vital for him to work them out in a short time, because two parts of Winnie the Pooh from the British company Jagged Edge are only the beginning of the whole horror universe, which is rapidly replenished with new projects. In the coming year we are promised to show horror movies about Peter Pan, Bambi and Pinocchio, and then all these monsters will unite in a crossover in the vein of Avengers. And that's not to mention the Winnie the Pooh threequel, which is already announced for 2026. And if the writers of future franchise films start working on their dramaturgy as carefully as they do on the murder scenes, this could be a truly significant event in the genre.